Okay, so how is everyone today? Good? Good. So, last time we talked almost exclusively about linear algebra, so that's fine because today we're going to talk about basically the exact same problems, except now instead of things being flat, things can be bent. So, it, we're, going to, we're going to say exactly the same things we said last time, except now there's potential curviness involved. Okay. Today is the 19th. <clears throat> okay, so as a reminder, uh, as a reminder, if, if I was to give you uh, a matrix, M, is, uh, say, 3 by 4, and by that I mean rows by columns. Then the map, so let this be the case. Then the map x maps to mx has what signature? R4 to R3, right? Because remember that, you know, we have the convention that things are always, in a sense, increasing to the right. So, so like when you draw a horizontal axis, the increasing direction is to the right. But it's a little bit confusing that the, th therefore, the input side uh, <laughs> of the matrix is the right side. So when you give an input to the matrix, you give it on the right instead of the left. So as a result, this is R4 to R3. So if I were to ask you to solve when asked to solve mx equal b for x, then what's the general technique that you have from, from linear algebra? Well, you can, can you compute M inverse? So you can't compute M inverse. You can't do that. Why not? Only square matrices can, be, can have an inverse. Uh, that is to say, this, this map can only be bijective if, uh, if the input space has the same dimension as the output space. Uh, Right, Co correct. That is to say, uh, this, this might be solvable. So uh, w under what case is this solvable for every B? When, when M is surjective, right? When, when this function is surjective, really, is, is better to say. Okay, which is to say that the column span has dimension what? Do y'all not call it column span? I'm getting blank looks with column span. The column space. Okay, then the column space has dimension what? Three, right? That means if, if you can solve for every B, that means that the column space covers all of R3. You, you, you couldn't find a B anywhere that you couldn't hit. Okay. So uh, now if if... That this map is not surjective. What that means is that, in principle, I could find a B uh, that you c I could the resulting equation you'd not be able to solve. But at any rate, the way that the way to to confirm or deny all of these things uh, that that we've just talked about is to is to begin to put M into reduced row echelon form. Okay. So then, specifically, when asked to solve this, you Take this matrix, and you put B right here as the, as the rightmost column, and then do what? Start doing row operations, right? The thing that they drilled you on so hard for so long. Okay, you get it to right here, where this is now M, and I'll give it a tilde hat, and B has a 
also its tilde hat. And you want this to be in reduced row echelon form. Okay, now, a couple, a couple things could occur. So how many, how many columns are in this M? And, and also this M, both of them? Four columns. Okay, so that means that, that means that um, because there's four columns and because the output size is three uh, dimensional, how many pivotal columns could you, could you possibly have? You could have up to three, right? You could also have two or one or even zero. And what it, but there's only one condition in which you could have exactly zero pivotal columns and what would that be? The, the zero matrix, right? zero matrix. <laughs> so uh, let's suppose, for just for sake of argument, suppose that we, we get to reduced row echelon form and it looks like this. So since it's three by four, it would have three rows and four columns. So uh, how about one, zero, zero, two, zero, zero, uh, three, one, zero, Three rows, four columns, so I only have one more. And then how about uh, zero, uh, two, one? So this is, this is M uh, taken to reduced row echelon form. And suppose that uh, B tilde is now mm, whatever numbers we like, but, <laughs> but small. <laughs> Negative one, two, and then one. OK. So suppose that, what I mean is suppose that this is that one. Then in the first place, in the first place, is, is supposing that M comes to this in reduced row echelon form, is the, map to, is the map X maps to MX surjective or is it not? So which one is it? It is surjective. So the first question is, is it surjective? And what's the answer to the question? So the answer is yes, but, the, but what is the test? Well, I, it doesn't need, it, so th there is something about the pivotal ones. There, there is something about that, but we don't need them to be so what I heard, you know, I might have misheard, but what I heard was that you need the pivotal ones to be in the first three columns. Okay, that's not true. <laughs> that would be nice if, it, if that were the case, but that doesn't have any bearing on whether or not it is surjective. There you go. You could say there's a pivotal one in every row. So where are the pivotal ones? Yeah, that one, that one, and that one. So what we need in order to be surjective, we need the same number of pivotal ones as the dimension of the output space. What's the dimension of the output space? Three, right? Do we have three pivotal ones? We do. Therefore, the answer to whether or not this is surjective, the question is, is do we have three pivotal ones? So, so the question of is it surjective is equivalent to this question and the answer is in the affirmative yes. So is it surjective? The answer is yes. That means that, yes? Um, why do they have to be ones? Well, th because this is reduced row echelon form. When you put it into reduced row echelon form, if, say, this were a five, then we could, we could put it more nearly in reduced row echelon form by dividing this row by five. Oh. That's all that I mean. <clears throat> Okay, so that means that as a result of this matrix being surjective, that means that we most definitely can solve this equation. We definitely can. Uh, so now how do we go about solving it? Once, once you have it here and we've decided, oh, it, it's definitely solvable, then what? <coughs> right, because what we're doing is we're solving this equation we're solving this equation so we can construe construing x vector x to have components 
x1, x2, x3, x4. That means that this column corresponds to x1, this column corresponds to x2, this column to x3, and this column to x4. So what this last row is saying, it's giving you an equation. What equation is this last row saying? Right, it's saying that 0x1s plus 0x2s plus 0x3s plus 1x4 is equal to 1. Okay, so as a result, we can say, okay, x4 is 1. That's what the last equation is saying. Terrific. Now, how does that help us? Right. So as a result of that, we can now take the, 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 the second to last equation, which is telling, what, is, what equation is the second to last row telling us? Very good, I think I heard it among all that. So x3 plus 2x4 is equal to 2. Okay, well that, that's, that's great because we already know what x4 is, so now we can substitute the value of x4 into here to obtain that x3 plus 2 in fact is 2, so then x3 is 0. That's nice. Then what? So now we know, now we know two of the variables, and you just keep moving up. Right, so what's the name for this keep moving up? There's a, it's so, it happens so common it has a name. Back substitution or back propagation. Okay, so this is the way you do it. This is the way linear problems are solved. The vast majority of, 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 of time that, that computers spend, okay, is more or less spent doing this. And I, that's not even an exaggeration to say. Okay, if you go home tonight, and you watch a few hours of cat videos. Okay, cats playing pianos, you know, cats chasing laser pins and things like that. Okay, to, to accomplish that, to accomplish that, something, something called the discrete Fourier transform is, the fast discrete Fourier transform is occurring, and that, that amounts to matrix multiplication. So literally, literally, it's true to say that when you watch your cat videos, this is occurring tens and hundreds of thousands of times a second so that you can watch your cat videos, okay? <laughs> this is the way of the universe. Okay, so I could just say etc. Now, suppose that, suppose that uh, this is continuation of the previous remark. Suppose that we have a different matrix that, 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 that we did M and we, we took it to reduce and we wanted to solve MX is B. And we did the same thing except we have a different M now and it comes to a different re reduced row echelon form. Suppose that we get 1, 0, 0, uh, 2, 0, 0, 3, 1, 0, and then mm, 0, 5, 0. And that this is, what was the, it doesn't matter, I'll just make up new numbers. Uh, how about 6, 7, 8? Okay, so, so my question is, <clears throat> my question is, uh, in the first place, is this M, and by, by this M matrix, I mean the map defined by matrix multiplication, is this M surjective? No, it is not surjective. Why is it not surjective? Again, it's a question about how many pivotal columns, how many pivotal ones does it have? It has two. It has two. Alternatively, you can say, oh, well, the reduced row echelon form of this matrix has a row of zeros. Okay, so it couldn't possibly be surjective. Okay, it couldn't possibly be surjective. Now, this equation, even though this, this matrix is not surjective, this equation in principle, this e equations with the non-surjective matrix in principle could be solvable. Is this one in particular solvable? No. It is not. Why is this one not solvable? Zero. Right. Because, again, naming the variables x1, x2, x3, and x4, this last row is saying that 
zero x one plus zero x two plus zero x three plus zero x four is eight. Of course, the left hand side is zero. So this is not solvable. Okay, this equation is not solvable. But suppose that it ended up looking like this. Uh, same matrix, one, two, three, zero, 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 one, five, zero, 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 zero. So it's exactly the same matrix, exactly the same, not surjective. And then I say, well, how about, uh, say, this one? Uh, two, one, zero. Can this equation be solved? It can. Now, I think, I think I might know what you mean by no. So the answer is yes, it can be solved, but what? You can't actually get numbers for your x's. You can get those you, you can definitely get numbers. But, but they're not unique. Right? They're not unique. So what this equation is saying now, and by row I mean equation, by, by equation, I mean row. What this row is saying is that 0x1s plus 0x2s plus 0x3s plus 0x4s is equal to 0. Well, of course it is, right? Of course it is. So what, what this is saying is that now there's going to be how many free variables? There's going to be two free variables. There's going to be two free variables because, because we have two pivotal ones two pivotal columns, and two non-pivotal columns. So that's to say that these variables, x1 and x3, are not free, and the other two are free. OK. <clears throat> you'd be able to back substitute, and you'd be able to state your answer for, 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 uh, for x1 and x3 in terms of x2 and x4. So there would be a solution, in fact, infinitely many. OK, good. So any question about this? OK, so you could have, you could have a, a, a matrix which is not surjective, but still have an equation that's solvable. Yes? Do we also have a free variable, though, in the first where we did have free variable ones? Yes. But then wouldn't that free variable give us an infinite solution? Because we have that line of solution. I agree entirely. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> no, no objection. So on the previous page, you'll note that these three, these three are not free. They're, they're pivotal. The non-pivotal one is free. So you'd be able to state a formula for x1, a formula for x3, and a formula for x4. And in principle, each one of them could depend on x2. OK, good. Any question about that? So a surjective. A surjective matrix, anything is solvable. Not surjective matrix, some things are solvable. Depends on whether or not the point that you end up selecting is in the column space uh, of, of the matrix. Good. So now, let's consider the, the specific case, <coughs> pardon me, when, when the matrix is square. And furthermore, let's consider the case uh, of the function f of x, uh, so f is a function which goes from r n to r n. So notably, the input space and the output space have the same dimension here. They have the same dimension. And let's consider uh, that m <coughs> is uh, n by n and injective. Now, me writing injective, that's kind of being just a little bit cute. So the fact that m is n by n and injective, what else does that mean? It's, it's also surjective and bijective, and there's one more i word that, is, that it is also invertible. OK, good. So suppose that we, we have uh, an injective uh, matrix, and suppose, furthermore, that f of x is defined by this formula. f of x is mx plus b, where b is in Rn. Okay, and suppose, <clears throat> suppose that we want to solve
f of x is equal to 0. OK, then, then this is really actually a very short sequence of algebraic steps to accomplish. So if we want to solve f of x is equal to 0, that's saying that mx plus b is 0. So then we can say that mx is negative b. And then can we solve for x and y? Yes, and because? OK, good enough, right? So it, because m is invertible. So x is negative uh, m inverse b. Now, that being said, this is just the way you write the analytic solution. But under no circumstance should you ever solve an equation like this in this way. And you never, ever compute the inverse of a matrix and then multiply it by b. That's a terrible way to go about doing things. Rather, what you do is exactly what we were talking about on the previous page, is you make the augmented matrix, reduced row echelon form, back substitute, and, and do it in this way. OK. <clears throat> Now, as a matter of a picture, this is the best I can do <laughs> for a picture. I'll say that this is a copy of Rn, and this is another copy of Rn. So you have to use your imagination a little bit. Uh, for, this, for this function, if you plug in, input x is 0, then what's the, uh, then what's the output? b, right? Because it'll be m times 0 and then add b. Uh, and in my picture, I'll put b down here. And uh, because this is uh, a linear map, and because I'm drawing it more or less in pseudo two dimensions, it'll look straight, flat. So this is y is mx plus b. And so when, when, I'm asking, when I'm asking to solve the equation equal to 0, what is, it that I'm, what is it on this picture that we're looking for? That right there, right? That's what we want, that point. Suppose we want to solve this. That is to say, algebraically, that's what we want, visually, that's what's being requested. Okay, and what I want to impress upon you is that if if the red bit is is flat, you know exactly what to do, and you knew exactly what to do before you got to this class. Okay. Now the question is: Is well, what if we replace the red bit with something that's not flat? What then? <clears throat> OK. So again, we're going to have f from Rn to Rn so that the input space and the output space have the same dimension, same dimension. And uh, suppose f is differentiable. And we want to solve the same equation. f of x is equal to 0. Except now I'm not giving you a formula. And so in principle, all that I'm saying is that f is some kind of differentiable thing, which means that it, it can be curvy and bent. But because it's differentiable, that means locally what? Locally, it's flat. So locally, if you squint your eyes, if you get close enough and squint your eyes, the problem looks just like this, locally. Globally, it can be bent. So this is going to be an example sort of like the, 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 the saying, when, when what you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. OK, so, <clears throat> so here we go. Suppose that the picture looks like this. OK, now, many of you have seen this before. And, what, and you, 
some of you might have some idea about what I'm building up to. Okay, so when you, when you know what it is that I'm talking about, have a guess and see if you know. So suppose we have got a curvy function and understand that this is, this is occurring in, you know, this is a copy <laughs> of Rn and this is a copy of Rn. But this is the best picture that I could possibly draw because, well, even, even if it was R2 and R2, I'd have to draw a four-dimensional picture and what would I do with that? I'm not sure. Okay, <clears throat> so what is it that we're looking for? What's being requested? Yeah, can you see that that's what we want? That's what we want right there. We want to find the input. We want to find the input that would produce the output uh, zero. That's what we want. Now, suppose that, well, in the first place, we don't know what input it would be. Uh, but maybe we've got a guess. And you say, well, let's just try something out. And if you don't have good reason to make a good guess, maybe just make a random guess. OK, let's guess this point right here. And I'll refer to our guess as A. So what we're going to do is say, OK, well, our function is differentiable. So what we'll do is we'll go up to this function and make our local coordinate system which is the way we always do. So this is A, what's, what's, this, uh, what's this value? F of A, right? That's F of A. And then because the function is differentiable, what we're saying is that locally, locally it, looks it looks flat. So let's perform the standard substitution. Let's say I substitute, I don't like your reality, I substitute it with my own. We'll, we'll take the red and substitute it with flat blue. Okay, now, uh, so of course that's the tangent. Hmm. What just happened? Did I hit that? Nope. That? Nope. Nope. Oh, man. I'll turn it off and back on. <laughs> I'm not even sure what I hit. can do it. Okay, we're back. Now it needs something to focus on. Okay, so locally right here we're saying, well, we're on, we're on the red world, but I substitute it with the flat blue world. Okay, so this is the point that we want. That's the point that we want, but we can't get it because basically when things aren't flat, we're helpless. Okay, our methods only work when, when things are flat. We can't get that one, but what can we get? Sorry? What can you see on this drawing, what specifically can we get? We can get that one, right? We can get that one. We, this is the one we want, we can't get it, but we can get that one. Okay, now in order, so we can get this one. So all that we really need to know is what, what's the equation of that flat blue thing. I don't want to call it a, a line because it's in principle not a line. This could be happening in 47 dimensions. So, believe it or not, it's exactly, it looks exactly like it does the point slope formula of a line, right? Y minus Y1 is MX minus X1. So this, this line is what? What's its formula? Y minus F of A 
is equal to, now if we were in college algebra, we, we would write m multiplied by what? x minus a, but we're not in college algebra. <laughs> so what do I need to write right there to make this correct? The derivative of f at a. Because after all, that's what tells you what it means to be flat. That's what it, that's what's, what it means to substitute the red world, which is curvy, with the blue world, which is flat. Y minus Y1 is MX minus X1. Okay, <clears throat> now, what we want to do, what we want to do, we want to, in order to do this, according to this equation, what's the name of that point, according to this equation? Well, it's when y is 0, a. this point is a, so this will be when what? This will, <laughs> this will be at x 0. I guess I need to write hats on all these. I'll do it without hats, doesn't matter. <laughs> so to get that point, that's when y is 0. So we, what we want to do is take this equation and solve for x. Solve for x when y is 0 in this equation. So does anyone know its name by now? What is it? It is a linear approximation, but we're, we're, we're going to find this one and then say, you know what, it would be even better if we could get a better one. Yes, named after a famous guy. This is Newton. Yeah, Newton Rapson. Right? You take a guess. And you say, you know what? This is curvy. <clears throat> it's curvy, and I don't know how to deal with curviness. So let's substitute the world with a flat world. And then this is the one we want, but that's the one we can get. OK, solve for x. So negative f of a is the derivative of f at a multiplied by x minus a. Now. The derivative of f at a, what kind of object is it? This is a matrix. And how many rows and columns? n by n, right? Because f, the, when, when construed as a, as a map, as a linear map, this matrix has to have the same signature as this one. So it's n by n. So what needs to be true in order for us to be able to solve this? Invertible. Okay, so if it's invertible, we can solve. Uh, so I want to move the matrix to the other side so that it would look like x minus a. And how would I have to write the left-hand side to get it to be right? Okay, very good. And I'll commute the negative to the front. So in particular, because I ran out of horizontal space. <clears throat> so because, because on the right hand side the matrix multiplication was on the left, that means the inverse multiplication must also be on the left. Okay, so we can solve for x x is a minus the derivative of f evaluated at a inverse multiplied by f of a. All right. So we had a. We wanted this point. We couldn't get it because we have to throw up our hands when it's curvy. But we can substitute the curvy world with a flat world. And then we can, then we can solve and we can get this point. And then the, the whole point, the, the, the to understand the rest of this method is just to say that, did you observe that we got a little bit closer? Well, let's do it again. And let's keep doing it until we stop moving. Okay, so then, so we'll, we'll come to here and then we'll do it again. We'll do it again, we'll do it over and over and over and over. And this is where I have to hedge my bets and say, hopefully, 
hopefully will converge to the point that we're looking for. So that's the best we're going to get in this, in this class is I'll just have to say hopefully because uh, we won't have enough time to prove that this is going to converge. Uh, under what conditions it will converge. You have a question? Well, I might be getting on to what you were saying. Okay. Doesn't this function have to constantly just sort of upward for this to work? Because when we get to a point like I think about this and draw the horizontal, uh, or draw the uh, tangent line, can we get behind our point? You, you could think of it, a li this is not a very, a, a really good analogy, but you can think of it like this. Imagine, imagine uh, a mountain range. And if you, if you, if you rained a lot of water, water would catch in different places in the local minima. If your first guess is not close to the local min that you want, the water's going to fall into the wrong one. Kind of, kind of, kind of like this. So if, we're just not going to be able to get a really precise answer. The main thing I want you to take away from this is that from linear algebra, you know how to solve the problem when the, when the surface is flat. You know how to do that. And now I'm telling you that suppose the surface is curvy, you can still solve the problem by substituting the curvy surface with the, with the corresponding flat one and then doing it over and over and over and over again. So instead of solving one linear algebra problem, you might have to solve like 10 linear algebra problems until it converges, right? Solve it once, and then again, and then again, and then again. So let's do it real quick, just so you can be convinced that I'm not blowing smoke here. <coughs> so an example would be f of x is, uh, say, mm, Well, I'll show you a, a neat trick. Suppose you want to compute the square root of x, and suppose that you're just strictly prohibited from using the square root button on your calculator. So that's just totally against the rules. All that you're allowed to use is add, subtract, multiply, and divide. That's all that you get. Could you, could you still compute the square root? And the answer is yes. <coughs> so uh, suppose, suppose specifically, Let's see, what do I want to do? We'll do the square root of x. Uh, I need to, how do I want to say this? Suppose we want to compute the square root of b. So you give me a specific b like say 2451 and you say I want you to compute the square root of 2451 <clears throat> then uh, that is to say uh, the square root of b is some is some x <clears throat> and if I square both sides of this equation then I get x squared uh, is equal to b and if I move the b to the other side x squared minus b is zero. <clears throat> now what I'm going to say is we want to solve the equation g of x, so the function is g of x minus b, and what we want to solve is g of x is equal to zero. So visually, Visually, what is g of x minus, uh, g of x is x squared minus b. What is that? It's a parabola, right? The, and it's shifted, it's shifted downward to b. Uh, so, and of course there's this other side, but we're only interested in the right side because originally we were talking about square roots. Now, what, what point on this drawing is it that we're looking for? Is that one right? That's the one we want. Okay. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> so the 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 update formula is the following. Suppose that we have uh, a guess over here of say C. <clears throat> then we would have uh, y minus c, no, y minus g of c, 
is the derivative of g at c multiplied by x minus c. So that's the equation of the tangent line at that point. And what we want to do is we want to solve for x when y is 0. So y is 0, so g of c here. And then what's g? Uh, well, I guess let's take it little steps at a time. g prime of c, <coughs> x minus c. So then what is g prime evaluated at c? It'll be 2c, right? Because the derivative of g is 2x, and then evaluated at c would be 2c. So this would be negative uh, <coughs> c squared minus b is 2c multiplied by x minus c. And what was it they were trying to do? We were tr which variable? <laughs> There's a lot of them floating around. It's x, right? Yeah, x is, x is the one that we're fishing for. OK, so we'll divide both sides by 2c. Two c is equal to x minus c, and then we can move the c to the other side so that it looks like uh, what? C minus c squared minus b over two c is x. Then what? We could, I mean, we could go with this. We could just just leave it here. But let's see if we can uh, simplify the formula any. <coughs> So suppose that, suppose that I divide this c into the numerator so that it looks like c minus c minus b over c over 2 is x. And then suppose we try and get a common denominator to do this. So to move, to move this c in here, I'll construe this as being 2c over 2. Then it will look like, so 2c. Uh, minus c and then plus b over c, distributing that subtraction over 2 is x. So c plus b over c oh, and then all of that over 2 is x. Now this formula is so common that it has many, many names, even ancient names. What's the name for this? The Babylonian method for computing square roots. So it's called the Babylonian method because well, old folks, back in the day, they're the ones, at least the earliest ones that we know of. But from an engineering point of view, this is referred to as the divide and average formula for reasons I hope that, are, that I hope are clear. You take the b that you're trying to compute the square root of, you divide it by your current guess, average it with your current guess, and that's your update. OK, so let's, let's try and do it in the specific case of, <coughs> of Uh, 2451. So I'll say that my first guess, what do, what do we want to be our first guess? So here's where you have to kind of 50. hope. Okay, 50? It, that's pretty close already. Okay, we'll guess 50. We'll guess 50, uh, and then the update formula will be that x n plus 1, that is to say the next guess, is obtainable by the current guess plus uh, 2451 over the current guess, and then that over 2. OK. So using that formula, twenty-four fifty-one. Oops. Answer. Okay, so I did a nice little trick here. I said, I typed 2451 so that A and S would be loaded with, with uh, no, I typed, oh, I, <laughs> that is what I did, so let me fix that. So I'll type, I'll type 50 so that A and S is, is loaded with 50. That's what, what A and S is now. And so now it's going to be 50 plus 2451 over 50 and then over 2. 
Okay, so next guess is 49.51. And now what's nice about that, the way I'm doing it, is that ANS is now loaded with 49.51, so I can just press enter again. 49.507, uh, 50757 stuff, and then maybe I press one more time. Okay, and by there it's converged. Wow, incredible, isn't it? So we computed square roots, and I'd like for you to note that we only used add, subtract, multiply, and divide, which means that which means that we converted the the, the curvy problem of computing a square root, because square root is a curvy surface, to a purely linear problem using only add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Okay, any question about this? <clears throat> okay, so you could do that uh, in principle to, to solve anything. Like you could ask, well, I could, I could say, what, what is one of the solutions to sine of x is equal to half? Pi over 6, right? Is that one? No, it's not. <laughs> Is it? Pi over 6? Is it pi over 3? Yeah, you're, you're right. You're right in the first place. <laughs> yeah, so, so, fine. So if I say, what, when, is sine, when is sine of x equal to half? Pi over 6. But when is it equal to, say, uh, 0 0.4? <laughs> I didn't know it could be 0 0.4. No, can, can it be 0 0.4? Sure it can. And if you wanted to know what input could you, could you give to the sine function so that the output would be 0 0.4, you could use exactly this method. Okay, by repeatedly using a linear approximation over and over again to get to the answer. And in fact, this is more or less exactly what your calculator does. Okay. <clears throat> Good. Second problem. So what I want, what, what I, by second problem I mean, notice that we solved a linear problem and then we, we solved a nonlinear problem by reducing it to a repeated iteration of a linear problem. Okay, and that's called Newton's method. Okay. So now suppose the following. Suppose that we have, uh, say, again, s similar looking thing. Uh, how about y? is mx plus b with m is n by n and injective. So because it's n by n and injective, that means it's, it's surjective and bijective and invertible. Okay, and if we were to plot this, it again, these would be the x's, and, and they would be in Rn. And these would be the y's, and they would be in Rn. And then the actual drawing would look something like this. Now, this function is injective, which means it's invertible. If this were really, if this were really R and R, so that this would, so that this was, if if this was really, oops, if this was really R and this was really R, then what would M be? It'd be a scalar, right? A one by one matrix. Okay, and if that were really the case, I could ask, what's the visual test to see whether or not what I've drawn here is invertible? The horizontal line test. Vertical line test is the test for whether or not it's a function. So is it, is it invertible in, if, if this were college algebra and I drew a, a line? It is because of the horizontal line test. Is it invertible because, uh, uh, in this context? Yes, because we said that M is injective. So what I, what I want you to consider <coughs> is that if we have the function, so given f of x is equal to mx plus b, this is a function now, we can compute the inverse function. Just using straight up algebra. 
Okay, so then that, what that means is I want you to take this equation, y is mx plus b, and do what? I want you to solve for x. That's what I want. So solve for x. How do you do it? We, we will need to do that, but first we'll need to do... Right. So y minus b is mx, and then what? Right. So inverse of m on the left multiplied by y minus b is x. Okay, and we can always do this in this specific circumstance because we specifically specified that m was square and injective. Okay, so that is to say the inverse function is <coughs> uh, i.e. f inverse evaluated at y is what? That bit, right? That thing we just wrote. Okay. So, construing it as a function of y. Now I know that in college algebra and things like that, you, you sometimes wrote the argument. If you had a function f of, uh, f of x, sometimes you wrote f inverse of x also. But I'm going to avoid doing that because I think that's a little bit confusing because that's sort of using the same name for things that are in the input space and things that are in the output space. Yes, they're both Rn, but these are the input ones and those are the output ones. So I'm going to keep calling these y. <coughs> okay, any question about this? Yes? Uh, I have a question about uh, what the code before about the using the option method. So yes? we don't need to choose an epsilon in this case. Um, we will stop because you said it converges, but it can go on forever. Right. So, so to, be, to be quite honest, what I did is I just hand waved the matter, which is to say that, which is to say that there's, there's a lot of conditions have to be met to make sure that you're going to converge to the, to the place that you want. And I'm just not going to talk about them. <laughs> all, that I, all, that, uh, all that I want to get across to you here and now is that you can solve the flat problem. And if, if the conditions are right, then you can solve the curvy problem by repeatedly substituting the flat problem. That's all that I'm trying to say. Yes? But the curve problem is just, is just a matter of choosing the right point. Like, there will always be a way to do it as long as you choose the right point. Not I'm, pur I'm purposefully avoiding the issue. Okay. But, but more or less, <laughs> more or less, it comes down to if the function is nice, if, it, if it's derivative, uh, it, if, if you compute the norm of its derivative and the norm of its derivative stays away from zero and also doesn't get too big, so like the, the norm of the derivative never gets too small, the norm of the derivative never gets too big, and the first guess that you had was kind of close for some definition of kind of, then it'll work. But I'm purposefully avoiding the issue. Yes? So a calculus teacher once told me that the, uh, the Newton method was actually kind of a special case of, of a, that, that whole, you know, you have a sum, you have the, the first derivative, second derivative, things like the Clorin series or Taylor series. Mm -hmm. um, it, is that like, for, but those are for like scalar value functions, but is it still the case like, like for this that you, you, you could have a, a series that approximates a value at a point? Ah, okay, so let me, let me see if I can rephrase your question. So, what I, what I just got finished saying is I just got finished saying that we can replace the curvy thing with a flat thing and then proceed that way. And what you just said, you said, well, flat things are great, but parabolic things are great too. So there is, besides this being the tangent flat, which is its name, there is also a tangent parabolic surface. So you can have another related method that says, well, instead of replacing this point with the tangent flat, I'll replace it with the tangent parabolic. It doesn't really help us here. But it doesn't help yeah. us here. Okay. So if you ever take a course in differential geometry, then you won't be considering tangent flats. Rather, you'll be considering tangent circles. 
and say, well, I want the tangent circle. And then if you go far enough, you get tangent other things too, like tangent bananas and what, and what, and what have you. <coughs> but right now, we're only interested in tangent flat things. OK, so now I lost track of where I was, actually. OK, we solved. We, we, we inverted a linear function that happened to be invertible. OK. <coughs> so let's consider an example here. What about this specific curvy function? f of x is 2x plus the sine of x. So we all know 2x, that's a, that's a straight line with slope 2. And we all know sine of x, that's the, well, it's sine, right? It goes up and down. Uh, let's consider for a moment, what's the derivative of this function? That'd be 2 plus sine of x, right? Uh, thank you, cosine of x. Now I have a question. What is the, what is the smallest that cosine can ever be? Negative 1. What is the largest that cosine can ever be? 1. So what is the smallest this derivative can ever be? 1. And what is the largest this derivative can ever be? 3. Right. So do you observe? that this derivative is between uh, 1 and 3. So that means that this function is strictly increasing. It is always going up. Okay? And it's always going up with at least slope 1, sometimes even slope 3. So if we were to plot it, <coughs> so, so just as a matter of, of uh, Definiteness. What what would we get? What would we get if we plugged in zero? To, for this one, <laughs> we'd plug in. We'd get zero, and then because if you plug in zero into the derivative, you get slope three. So that means from here we'd leave with slope three, and then because because sine oscillates, that means that we'll still be going up, but sort of oscillating back and forth between slopes three and one. OK, so it goes, it goes up quick, and then a little less quick, and then more quick, and then a little less quick, and then more, et cetera. So all that I want you to see from this, from this example, is in the first place, is, is, f, uh, is f injective? Which is to say, what, what is the college algebra test for injectivity? Horizontal line test. Does it pass the horizontal line test? Yes. yes, because it is a strictly increasing function. It's strictly increasing. So then I could ask, for example, I could say, well, one of the possible outputs is, one of the possible outputs is, say, um, 2. Right? That's one of the possible outputs. And what if I say, I want you to tell me the input that could provide that output. What would you have to plug in to do that? And suppose that I say, and I don't want you to draw a graph and then measure. I don't want you to do that, right? Not, not that kind of thing. How could, you, how could you go about solving this? Well, so I'm asking you to solve uh, 2x plus the sine of x is equal to 2. That's what I'm asking. So this is we're, what, what I'm asking you to do is to solve something nonlinear is equal to 2. Well, we don't know how to solve nonlinear things equal to 2. The only thing we know how to do is solve nonlinear things equal to 0. Well, I guess we're just out of luck. What do we need to do? Subtract 2, right? Move the 2 over. OK, so 2x plus sine of x minus 2 is equal to 0. So now do you observe that the structure of, of the question is that solve a curvy thing equal to 0? Ah, well, how could we do that? Newton's method, which is to say, which is to say locally take the flat approximation and then do that over and over. OK, so now, furthermore, what I want you to see is that there is nothing special about 2. I said 2, but there's nothing special about it. I could have asked about 3. So using Newton's method, you could solve it again for 3. And using Newton's method, you could solve it for 3.1.
and in fact any number. So what I want to tell you is that right now, even though, even though there is no analytic inverse for 2x plus sine of x, there isn't one. That is to say, if I was to ask you, uh, if you were asked, to solve the equation <clears throat> y is 2x plus sine of x for x, this task is impossible, uh, is what I mean to say is analytically impossible. What I mean to say by that is that there isn't some kind of formula where you could say x is, you know, cosine or something like that. There's no way you could write down a closed form solution for x. However, you could, in principle, one by one, tell me every single value. I could say, what would I have to put in? What, what x would you have to put in so that 2 would come out? Okay, so, <clears throat> so even though you can't analytically inverse, in, invert this function, you could point by point invert it. Okay. So, now, you could point by point invert the whole thing, is what I'm saying. So now let's consider f of x is sine of x, just regular old sine of x. So of course sine of x looks like this. Etc. So, can you, is, is this function injective? It's not injective. It's not injective because, uh, well, it doesn't pass the horizontal line test, which is to say, there's, for example, there's lots of places uh, where sine of x is zero, infinitely many of them. But here's the, the calculus point of view. And that is, let's consider, for example, this input right here and that point on the plot right there. So near that point, if we attach, if we say, if we do the same differential calculus point of view and say, well, I'm just going to attach the flat approximation to that world because that's the main hammer that we have, I'll do it. So that blue function, it's a function. The blue is a, is a separate function than the red function. Is that blue function invertible? It is. The blue function is invertible because it passes the, the horizontal line test. OK. Well, we can't invert the red function, but we can invert the blue function. We can invert the blue function. And so here's the idea that I want to get across to you, is that because the derivative right here, <clears throat> so because the derivative at that point is non-zero, we can locally invert f of x, which is to say we can cut out a piece. And if you look at the red that's just contained in that box that I just cut out, is it injective? Just, <laughs> just that piece that we cut out. Yes. It is. So we should be able to locally invert that. OK, so this is, this is the idea, is that even though we can't uh, we can't globally invert sine because we found a place where the tangent exists, where the derivative exists and is non-zero, we should be able to locally invert it right there. So does everybody understand the idea? So now let's try and state it uh, more formally. <clears throat> Think 
theorem. This is called the inverse function theorem. Let uh, F from X to Rn with X a subset of Rn open with point A in X. F continuously differentiable. continuously differentiable on x. So please remind me, what does continuously differentiable mean? All partial derivatives exist and are continuous. And then what's the nice relationship to that and the Jacobian? Yeah, <laughs> that, the, that, that, the, that the function is in fact differentiable. And the, the matrix of the derivative is the same as the Jacobian. Right? It's not one of those nightmare scenarios where you can compute the Jacobian where you can, and then the derivative either and, and then the derivative doesn't exist. Right? It's terrible. Okay, but but we're saying we're we're in a we're in a safe place where that's not going to uh, occur. <coughs> is continuously differentiable on X and the derivative of f evaluated at a uh, is injective. Now, what does that mean? It means invertible. Because, uh, well, in the first place, when you, this, this means the linear map, OK? And then we could say, well, specifically, we're talking about the matrix. How many rows and columns does this matrix have? n by n, because the input inputs are coming from n, outputs are in n, so this is square. And an injective square matrix is automatically surjective and bijective and, and invertible. OK. Uh, is injective, so at, at a, because I'm specifically saying a. Then there exists an epsilon greater than 0 such that uh, f, uh, what do I want to say? Such that f is locally invertible on the ball of radius epsilon centered at f of a. So now this deserves a picture. But again, the best picture that I can draw is that pseudo one that looks like this. So here's a copy of Rn. Rn. Here's a copy of Rn. OK, so something like this. I'll draw down here so it's out of my way. So something like this. So is, is this function that I drew invertible? It is not invertible. It's not invertible. And if you take, if you take, uh, if you momentarily suspend that I'm saying that this is Rn and that's Rn and, and we take this to be R and R, where is this, where is the uh, derivative not injective? Where is it not injective? Whenever it's horizontal, right? That is to say, whenever the derivative is a matrix of zeros. So, so for example, right here, right here, this is a, this point is singular, so 
this is not injective, not an injective derivative right there. This one, this point right here would also uh, not be injective. And what I want you to see is that besides, on my particular drawing, besides those two points, the derivative would be injective everywhere else. Okay? So, <clears throat> suppose that were, say, right here. Uh, where do we call it? A. We make our local coordinate system, same way we always do. And then we say, OK, we'll substitute the flat world. What this theorem is saying <coughs> is that you can go back all the way over to the output right there. And what is this value right here? This is f of a. And so, so what this theorem is saying is that there's a ball somewhere. Where is this ball? Is it, is it right here? No, it's around, it's around f of a, right? Because remember, our, our typical, the, 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 the typical idiom for drawing is that these are the inputs and these are the outputs. But we're talking about an inverse function, so now the roles are reversed. These are going to be the inputs and those are going to be the outputs. So what we're, what we're saying is that there's a ball uh, up here. And now this looks like an interval, but don't be misled. It, it only looks like an interval because I can't, a two-dimensional drawing is the best I can do. I can't make a four-dimensional drawing. This is a ball in, in Rn. So now if we take these back to the red, What we're saying is that this ball over here ends up cutting out a piece of the red. Let's zoom in on it real good here. It ends up cutting out a piece of the red. Oh, come on. So just that piece that's between the two open circles is just that piece injective. It is. Just that piece is injective. And what, what we're saying is that you, you can cut out that piece, and then now you can start saying, well, what input would I have to do to get that output? So you could ask, which one of these would I have to give to get that particular point? Well, how could we solve that? With Newton's method, <laughs> the, same, the same tool that we have. We're going to keep using Newton's method over and over again, but I do want you to understand that Newton's method is just, let's use the flat method as many times as we can. Right? We just resort, which is what I meant when I said, when, when what you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. We're just going to keep <laughs> using this tool. This is the tool that we have. I hear packing. Are we getting low on time? I think we still have time. Lots of time. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, good. So this is the inverse function theorem. Now, there's a related theorem. In, in fact, come on. The theorem, the next theorem we're going to talk about is equivalent to this theorem. So you have to prove one or the other, and then you have both. So this one... Let's now look at the linear problem. So we have enough time to look at the linear problem in the following seconds. <laughs> so let's consider uh, <clears throat> this particular equation. So how about 2, uh, negative 3 multiplied by x, y is equal to 0. So in the first place, should that be zero scalar or zero vector? Scalar, right? Because what we're, what we're considering is we're considering the, the function which takes an xy 
and then maps it to uh, 2, negative 3, x, y. And what are the dimensions of this con uh, as a matrix? 1 by 2. So it's going to take two-dimensional inputs and produce a one-dimensional output. And so if we were to write this, if we were to uh, go ahead and carry out that multiplication, what do you get? 2x minus 3y is equal to 0. And now, now that you have this equation, my, my request of you is, can you solve for y? In terms of x is what I mean. So can you? Sure you can, right? So we could say, what, y is, uh, is 2 thirds x. Beautiful. So now, this is a matrix, and this is a linear map. The solutions to this equation are called the what? I'm fishing for a K word or an N word. Kernel or null space, right? These solutions, the solutions to this, are elements of the null space, or if you like, elements of the kernel of this matrix. So what we're going to do next time is we're going to say, we're going to, we're going to review that problem that we already solved. Solve for some variables in terms of other variables within the kernel, and then we're going to do it for the curvy problem. And remember, uh, seven days from now is, the, is an exam. And I'll post the keys to quizzes one through six tonight or tomorrow night. <laughs>